Hi everybody, thanks for joining me here for this video. In this video, we're gonna discuss trends in human resource management, and this video is meant to accompany the Fundamentals of Human Resource Management, eighth edition textbook by Noe and colleagues. We're covering chapter two here today. Okay, now the first question we're gonna start with in this video is how is the labor force changing? Okay, so what's influencing these trends? And before we get started, I wanna make sure we define a, key, a few key terms. The first term is going to be the internal labor force, and this basically refers to the employees within an organization. The second term that we want to define is the external labor market, and this term basically refers to all of your job seekers or people who are out there looking for work. Now, as we move forward and we seek to answer this question, one of the first things we're going to talk about is the aging workforce. So one of the things that we're starting to see is that the workforce is becoming older. We're seeing a greater proportion of employees in the workforce be 55 years of age or older. And there are a few reasons behind this. The first one is that many people keep working for personal fulfillment. Okay, and the idea here is when they think about retirement, they don't necessarily know what they're going to do if they retire. They've let their work become an important part of their identity, and letting go is going to impact their, their ability to be fulfilled as a person. The second reason that we tend to see an aging workforce is that there's financial need out there. Okay, so some employees have big aspirations for retirements. They want to travel. They want to see the world. And that costs money, and they might not have enough savings to do that. And others may simply not have enough savings to retire comfortably. Okay, we're also seeing a more demographically diverse workforce. And this is really more reflective of the diverse population within the United States where we're, where we're seeing this more diverse workforce. Okay. Now, what does this changing labor force mean for human resource managers? Well, the aging and diverse workforce means a couple different things, okay? The first thing that we're gonna talk about is you need to understand the needs and expectations of your employees. People who are coming from different generations may have different, different expectations. Older generations may look more towards job security being an important component to their employment, whereas the younger generation may look more towards employability, and we're going to discuss that a little bit later on when we get into psychological constructs. Okay, people of different cultures may also have different needs and expectations. Okay, we're also going to want to look to value diverse perspectives. When we bring diversity into the workplace, we're not going to get the same ideas and the same thoughts from all of our employees. And that's a good thing because that allows us to see different perspectives that we can use to, to better our company. Okay, the next component we want to look at is we want to understand the impact of our communication. Okay, very often when we're dealing with different groups of people, they may interpret different meanings from, from different statements. Okay, I remember years and years ago, I was coaching a, a sports team, a cross-country team, and we had athletes from many different countries on the team. And, and one day, there was a pretty big conflict between our athletes, and the conflict came down to just a, a complete misunderstanding because of different interpretations of the language. So we want to make sure when we have you know, a diverse workforce that we're thinking about, how does our communication impact all of our employees, not just the employees who are like us? Okay, and then finally, we want to work to eliminate bias and prejudice in the workplace. And th this is key here, and, you know, there's a whole unit in this textbook on this topic, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on this right here. But it's very important that as we recognize the diversity of our workforce, we have policies and procedures in place to make sure that we're making sure that, that, work for, that our workplace is equitable to all employees. Okay. In addition to the changes that we talked about, we're also dealing with skills deficiencies in the workforce. Okay, so we see, you know, there is a lack of technical and computer skills. This, this is what we're looking for out there. Okay, we have a need for creativity in the workplace. We need people who can work autonomously, and we also need people who are adaptable. Okay, now this adaptability here, when we look at when we look at this component, this highly relates to the technical and computer skills. And what I mean by that is the technology that we need people to know in the workplace today may not be the same technology that we need them to know in 20 years. So I don't just need employees who have a specific skill set when it comes to, to different computer programs, but I need people who not only know the programs I need them to use today, but who have the ability to learn new programs and adapt to new technologies as they come out into the workplace. Okay, now as we think about skills, deficiencies, and diversity, it's interesting to think about how one impacts the others. So we have these deficiencies in the workplace, as we discussed earlier. They result in us expanding our external labor market. And what I mean by that is, 
you know, we typically would consider our external labor market to be a specific area in which we recruit our employees. But as we notice that there are skills deficiencies in this market, we may start looking in places other than where we've looked historically. And as a result, we're going to have more diverse internal labor force. All right, next, we're going to briefly move on to talk about high performance work systems. Now, as we discuss high performance work systems here real quick, I want to take a trip to the DC universe. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm a little bit of a comic geek. Um, and while I do enjoy the Marvel Cinematic Universe, DC is always, always my home, right? So I want you to imagine that you are starting a new superhero team that uses bows and arrows. So it's an archery equipped superhero team. I want you to think about who would you recruit, okay? Would you recruit Hal Jordan, the Green Lantern? Well, I mean, he's great with a, with a powered ring, but we don't know anything about his archery skills, right? Would you, would you recruit Shire or Hawkgirl? Well, she's great with a mace, but again, we don't know anything about her abilities with a bow and arrow. You know, who you'd probably look for would be somebody like Oliver Queen, who's known for his archery skills. Okay, and that seems pretty, pretty self-explanatory. So now we're going to move on with this question. I want you to think about what if you wanted your team to be, your team members to be great collaborators. Would you recruit Batman, somebody who's known for wanting to work alone? Probably not. Okay, now the point that I'm trying to get to here is that when we look at high performance systems, what we need are we need people and technologies and social structures that all work well together, okay? Our people, our technology, and our social structures within the organization need to complement each other in order to have a high performance work system. And one important component to the people that we have here is we have our knowledge workers, okay? Now, knowledge workers are people who not only have skills, but they have understanding and knowledge, as you would imagine, that is unique and valuable to the company. So what makes knowledge workers different? If we think about it, they have this valuable knowledge that we discussed. And that knowledge gives them power. And what do we mean by gives them power? Well, knowledge workers are in a unique position to be able to dictate some of their behaviors and negotiate because they have, they have knowledge that as the organization we need, but we can't force them to give us, okay? Now this, this relationship that we're looking at over here between the valuable knowledge and the knowledge workers power is clearly moderated by what we would call the availability of knowledge. Okay, and what I mean by that is that this valuable knowledge gives the knowledge workers power as long as the knowledge that they have is not readily available. The more available this knowledge becomes, the weaker the relationship between their knowledge and their power is. Okay, and I'm gonna give you an example on this from, from my, my time in the workplace. Back when I was in industry, I uh, spent some time as a pricing manager. And I was a pricing manager during an economic downturn in, in 2008. Okay, now one of the great strengths that I had was I had revamped my company's, pri my company's pricing system. And I was the only person who knew how to use it. So as our industry was going through some turmoil and there was a lot of downsizing, I was able to survive layoff after layoff after layoff. I continued to remain employed. Now, what happened later on was the company realized that, that we needed to consolidate some positions. And one of the things that they wanted to do is they wanted to consolidate managers in pricing with managers in purchasing, okay? And they ended up asking me to, to train someone as a backup in managing the pricing system. So at, at the time, I didn't realize what was going on. I, I agreed to train this person. And, you know, if I could go back and talk to my former self, I would say the knowledge that you had about your pricing system, that was unique and that's what gave you power. Don't necessarily sh share that information. From the company's perspective, though, however, what they did was by getting me to share that information, they were able to reduce my power so that as the company went through, through restructuring, you know, I was not in a position to, to dictate what my role was going to be. Okay, so next, we're going we're gonna to move forward here again and look at empowerment in the workplace. Okay, now as we talk about empowerment, I want you to think about what empowerment means from a basic standpoint is that we tell our employees the work that we want them to do, but we don't tell them how to, how to do the work. So essentially, 
they're responsible for achieving their goals and they dictate the process that they use to achieve those goals. So our employees have specific goals that they need to achieve, but we're gonna let them get there however it is that they wanna get there, okay? Now, if they achieve those goals following the path that they've decided to follow, they're gonna benefit from that. And if they don't achieve those goals, then they're gonna be held accountable. It's, pr it's pretty simple. Now, I, I wanna talk to you about empowerment though through a few examples. And the first one that I'm gonna start with is we're going to look at Zappos. We've got an example from Zappos here. And this story comes straight from Tony Shea. Tony Shea's book, Delivering Happiness. Now, Tony Shea is the CEO of, of Zappos. Um, and he told a story about how when the company was looking for funding, he had a meeting with potential investors in New York. So he got there, got there kind of late, met with the investors, uh, saw them in the hotel lobby. Everybody was hungry. They wanted to eat. And, you know, a few of them were trying to figure out what they wanted to do. They kind of decided they wanted to get some New York pizza, but they didn't know what was going to be open, what wasn't going to be open. So Tony says, let me make a quick phone call. He said, I'll call my company and we'll, we'll find out real quick. So Tony picks up the phone and he calls Zappos 1-800 number. And he says, hi, this is the address I'm at. I'm looking for, for a good New York pizzeria that's open right now that we can get some delivery from. So they said, yeah, no, no problem. Um, just give us a second here. And then they gave him a few options for different pizzerias. He thanked them, took the information down, and then proceeded to call and order the pizza. While they were waiting for the pizza, one of the investors said to Tony, they said, you didn't even introduce yourself when you called the, the 1-800 number. How did they know it was you? And Tony said, they probably didn't. And the investor responded, well, then why did they help you out with getting the number of the pizzeria. And Tony said, the answer to that is pretty simple. The directive we give to all of our employees at Zappos is that it's their job to make every customer happy. And that's it. And they can do whatever they need to to make that happen. He said, so I called. They knew I needed to find pizza to make me happy. And they helped me. That's it. That's an example of empowerment. Now, the second example I want to give you is I want to talk about, about some empowerment with cashiers. Okay, and I worked for a retail company at one point in my career, and this company had actually changed its theory on empowerment and how it treated its employees. And early on in the, the company's culture, they had had a very, a very controlling and punitive culture where people had very specific policies that they had to follow, and they needed to, to get approvals as they move forward. Okay. At the time that I worked for the company, things were a little bit different and we were really looking more at empowering our people. Okay. So I had about a hundred, 150 employees under me in the, in the location that I managed. And I, I had a cashier who would always call me and ask me about different markdowns. And I never quite understood why the cashier would call me because there were about three layers of management between this cashier and I. And one day we had a discussion about this and I said to the employee, you know, why do you call me every time somebody needs a couple dollars off of something? And she said, well, I don't want to get in trouble for doing the wrong thing. And I know that if I call someone else, they're just going to end up calling you. And I said, well, that's not actually, that's not actually accurate. I said, I don't want you to call anybody. I said, you, you have up to $50 you could take off of any transaction at your, at your discretion at any point in time. All I want you to do is make sure our customers get out of here fast with the material they need and that they're happy when they leave. And we had a long discussion about it and it, it turned out that this, this employee, we had put a procedure in place to give our employees empowerment, but we hadn't been clear enough on what the benefits and the were of utilizing your empowerment and what the consequences were of not utilizing your empowerment. So the employee actually was struggling with this. So part of empowerment is not only making sure employees know what they can do in trying to do their job, but also making sure that they understand that they're not going to be held accountable for making the wrong decision, but they are going to be held accountable for making sure that they utilize their empowerment. Okay, now the next piece we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the HR role and strategy. And human resource managers play an important role in mergers and acquisitions, downsizing, outsourcing, quality standards, and a variety of different strategic things that companies, that companies do. Now, we're not going to break down each one of those individually, but I want to just give you a few questions that you can think about 
to kind of conceptualize where HR's role and strategy is. The first question that I, that I want you to think about is what is the company trying to do? What is our goal? Okay. And then I want you to move forward and think about where do people add value to this? Okay. So if you know what the company is trying to do and you can think about where people add value, you can start to have HR play an important role in the company strategy. All right, as we move forward and talk about HR's role and strategy, I want to bring you through an example here. And in chapter one, we talked about HR responsibilities of supervisors. So, you know, I'm going to go back to when I was a manager in an organization and I had been given a unit that was losing six figures a year and was told, okay, we need you to turn this around. Okay, now as I was given this unit, I was, I was given a directive that I needed to reduce costs. Okay, the belief was that the the most effective way that I was going to turn around the losses of, of this location were to reduce costs within the location. Shortly after I took over the location, however, I actually put in a request to increase my staff. So I'll ask you to think about why would I maybe have done this? Well, when we say that my directive was to reduce costs, that was my directive. But that was thinking about the goal, which was to increase profits, not to reduce costs. And the company at the time thought that reducing payroll was the path to profits here. They thought that reducing costs largely through payroll was how we were going to get this done. But what I realized as I began analyzing data in my location was that I actually needed to invest in payroll in order to increase my location sales. Because what I realized was when I, when I took and minimized all of my costs within the organization, there was no pathway to profitability without an increase in sales. And the only way that I was going to achieve that, that increase in sales, was to increase my staffing. So this is just an example of when we think about strategy, it very easily looked like, okay, reducing costs is what HR is being directed to do. But after analyzing the business, I realized that I need to actually increase costs by investing in payroll in order to achieve the sales that I needed to hit our overall goal of becoming profitable again. All right, next we're going to talk about technology in HR. And there are a few different places where technology is impacting human resource management. First is we're going to look at information systems that they're automating processes such as payroll, employee benefits, and such. Okay, and the result that this, this has is HR managers now devote less time to administrative tasks than they did in the past because of this technology. Okay, this also goes back to, you know, as we're tying things together here, think about when we talked about skill deficiencies. Okay, we need HR managers to not only understand, understand people and, and HR-related finances, but we need them to understand technology because if they don't understand HR information systems, they're not going to be able to allow these systems to take on the tasks of administrative tasks. Okay. Next, also we look at analyzing large amounts of data to guide decisions, something we call people analytics. And what this does, this supports our HR roles of being a business partner and being a strategic partner. Now, earlier in this video, I made mention of psychological contracts. And, you know, typically when we think of contracts, we think of written documents where terms are split explicitly defined, but not all contracts are written. And that's where psychological contracts come in. And I want you to, to reflect on this question here as we move forward. Have you ever done something for anyone without the ex with the expectation that they would do something for you in return? Okay, and this happens in a lot of different places. And the reality is that organizations are, are no exception, okay? But one of the things that we're seeing happen is that employee expectations have changed over time. So as we mentioned earlier, you know, generations ago, employees expected job security. Okay, but through, through multiple um, financial recessions and, 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 situ and negative situations in organizations, we have seen that organizations can't always provide job security. Okay, so there do come times where organizations do have downsizing. Okay, and you know, the up and coming generations are more familiar with this. They recognize that no matter what is put out there, they're not necessarily going to have job security. So they really are more focused on employability. They want to be developing skills in the in the workplace that help them ensure that if they do lose their job, they're going to be able to get another job. 
or that if they can't advance the way they want to within their company, that they'll have the ability to be mobile. Okay, so managers need managers and HR managers need to understand that the expectations of employees are changing. Okay, now when we think about psychological contracts in a diverse workforce, one of the things that happens as we as we discussed before is that people have different expectations. Okay, so we can't assume as as HR managers that all of our employees are going to have the same exact psychological contract based upon the same expectations because there may be different expectations. We may have some employees who are looking to be rewarded financially. We may have other employees who are looking to be rewarded with the type of work that they do. You know, and one of the things that we have to do here is we really have to kind of get to the bottom of what it is that our employees are looking for. As our workforce becomes more diverse, the possibility that we're going to have different psychological work, psychological contracts in the workplace increases. Okay. The final section that we're going to cover here is, is flexibility. And to start, we're going to talk about flexible staffing. Okay. And first here, we're, we've, we're going to discuss independent contractors who are basically self-employed people. Okay. So they're not employees of the company. There are people who we hire independently to do work for the company. Okay, they are, they're paid an agreed upon amount. They are responsible for their own benefits, paying their own taxes, et cetera. Okay, now in theory, independent contractors can work with many different companies. Now, sometimes we see this work, sometimes we don't. There are companies that have restrictions on who independent contractors can work with. But if companies place too many restrictions on independent contractors, the independent contractors can sometimes sue to be recognized as employees. All right. Next, we'll cover, temp we'll cover temporary workers who are employed by a temp agency. In this case, the company contracts with the temp agency to get workers when needed, but they don't, they don't have a direct relationship with the workers. Okay. Then there are different types of flexible employment positions. Okay, so one of them would be an on-call worker, and this is where you're continually classified as an employee, but you only work when, when needed. Okay, so for example, sometimes consulting companies have on-call consultants who remain on a, company's, on a company's roster, but they only actually work when the company has projects that they want them to, to work on. But because they remain active employees, you know, when a project comes up, they just simply call them put them on the project and they build their hours as appropriate. Okay. We also have contract workers who sign a contract to work for a very specific period of time and they cease to be employees after the contract expires. So they may sign a, a one year contract. They may sign a contract to work on a specific project for the duration of the project. But once the contract reaches its end, the employment arrangement then ceases to exist. All right. We're also going to talk about flexible work work arrangements as these are becoming more popular in the in the workplace. Okay, and with flexible work arrangements, you know, employees basically are expected to maybe work core hours. So there may be key hours during the day that the company needs them to work, but non-core hours are completely at the employee's discretion. So for example, if a business was had critical meetings between the hours of eleven and two, employees may have to work between eleven and two but the other five hours of their day may be at their discretion. So they may be able to work 11 to seven. They may be able to work six to two. That might be at their discretion. They may have a break in their, in their day. Um, but that's, that's the flexibility is that the employees get to determine outside of core hours when they work. Now this becomes a little bit, a little bit challenging for managers because managers often, often like to assess employees processes that they go through. But when we have flexible stand, flexible staffing in place, managers have to learn to evaluate outputs and not processes. So when we put flexible staffing in place, it kind of, it kind of requires a complete shift in how we, in how our managers think within the organization. All right. So that's our introduction to trends in trends in human resource management. Thank you for joining me and we'll talk to you soon.